Right, so coming back to the presentation, uh, what we're actually going to be doing today is we're going to look at a few of the wireless sensors a bit more closely. Um, so we're going to be looking at the wireless temperature sensor, wireless pH, wireless light and the smart car. Um, so these comprise some of our most popular sensors, which is why I'm focusing on them today. Um, so I'm going to have a look at how they operate in Sparkview, um, which is that free app which I was telling you about. It's also available for both Windows and Mac machines. Um, but there is a price associated with those um, software licenses. So yeah, please do be aware of that. Um, and on top of looking at how the sensors work on their own, um, we're also going to be tackling some of the required practicals. Um, so we're going to be running through neutralization using both the, um, the pH sensor and the temperature sensor. Um, and we're also going to be looking at the inverse square law using both the light sensor and the Pasco smart cart. Um, right, so what I'm going to do is, oh, I hope everyone could still see my PowerPoint. I think they could. <laughs> I'm going to ping you over to my other camera. Oh, someone else joining late. Just admit them. Hi, Fran. Hi there. Welcome along. Um, I'm just going to mute you if that's OK. Um, and, of course. Uh, uh -huh. yeah, if you want to turn your camera off, that would be great as well, just to make sure our bandwidth uh, stays a bit low. I will. <laughs> nice to I see will. you though. <laughs> right, so I'm going to ping you across to my other camera so you can see what I'm doing. You won't be able to see my face, but um, when it's on that kind of display, you'll see um, why I needed to be there. Let me just do this. Right, so hopefully you can see <laughs> my rather cluttered desk now. <laughs> um, so yeah, the camera the camera is in a really odd angle, but I need it to be like this for the inverse square law because I need the um, the bulk of my my desk space, and also you can see this lovely lamp which I'm going to be using as my light source. Um, so the first one I'm going to show you today is the uh, wireless temperature sensor. Um, so here it is in all its glory. I just admit somebody else. Uh, yeah. So um, historically, uh, Pasco have also always been kind of like viewed as like the Rolls Royce of, of the data logging world. Um, and because of that, they've always kind of had that. Oh, let me just make sure everyone's muted. Hello, Mr. Fenton, don't mind me. <laughs> Um, so yeah, because because they've always been like revered as the Rolls Royce of data logging, it's kind of assumed that they still have the kind of price tag associated with that. And historically, uh, you know, I'll be the first to admit that it's not the most um, affordable of brands. Um, but all of that changed about five or six years ago when Pasco launched this new brand of, uh, of wireless sensors. Um, so how these differ is that uh, Pasco have actually put a Bluetooth radio inside of this sensor housing. So what that means is that it can connect directly to like a, an iPhone or your PC. It doesn't need any cables. It doesn't need an interface. Um, so that makes it a whole lot cheaper because you don't have to buy any like um, accessory interfacing links to uh, to get this to connect to a device. Um, so typically in terms of a sensor, you're looking about a third of the price that it was originally in, in the, like the older blue sensors because you'd have to buy the sensor and you'd have to buy the interface as well. And the cheapest wireless interface that we used to do was about 150 quid. Um, and then obviously you've got the sensor on top of that, which could be anything from about 50 pounds. Um, so this temperature sensor is the cheapest one that we've got on the market at the moment. So this one goes for 50 pounds. So when you compare that to the previous price, you can see it's a hell of a lot cheaper. <laughs> so let's have a look at this one in action. Um, what I'm going to do, we've got someone else waiting. Yep. I'll just admit them in. Make sure they're on mute. Perfect. So let's take a look at this one in action. What I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen from my phone just so that I can see on my screen um, what I'm sharing in terms of content and then what's coming up on this on this camera as well. Nicola, we're not getting you full screen, just a wee thumbnail. I know, I don't quite know how to fix that. So I know how to make myself a spotlight. So everyone should be able to see my camera feed. I know it's super, super small. Um, 
click on the thumbnail. So I think as a user, you guys, I think if you double click on my thumbnail, it should come up super big. I'm hoping. <laughs> I think that's how it works. Um, Teams is definitely not my preferred platform, um, but it's the only one that we've been uh, kind of forced to use because um, there's problems with Zoom in Scotland. I think some LEAs have banned it. Um, so yeah, we're kind of forced to stuck with uh, team, forced to be stuck with Teams, I'm afraid. Right, okay, so uh, let me come onto Teams on my phone. And then I want to share my content on here. Hello. Share. Not share video, don't do that. Share screen. Start broadcast. And then you guys should hopefully be able to see my screen coming up in a moment. I seem to have. Can I see my screen? <laughs> uh, afraid not. How do I? Didn't work for me two seconds. Let's have a look. I'm definitely sharing my screen, but it's not coming up on my um, on my thingy. Let me stop this sharing and then let's try again. Yes, thank you. phone what are you doing to me if it doesn't work I'll just try one more time on this one and if it doesn't work I will um, just do it on my on my laptop instead bear with me two seconds I can see your desk full screen now excellent and this is me trying to come in on my phone Let me Turn my audio off so we don't get any feedback. And then if I come to share, please work this time. I seem to just be getting um, Claire's feed here for some reason. I don't quite know how to stop that. Start broadcast. Oh, bingo. Here we go. Can everyone see that? See my phone screen? I think there was a little bit of a lag there. I think we're back in real time now. Perfect. <laughs> right. Sorry about that, guys. Um, right. Let's get started properly. So I'm going to come on to Sparkview. Seems to be keeping up with me. Excellent. Right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn my temperature sensor on. Uh, so I'm just going to press this little on button here. And then you should be able to see the uh, red LED, red Bluetooth LED flashing down here, showing that my sensor's on and ready to pair. If my battery was low, we'd get this little LED up here flashing, but it's not doing so. My battery's all good. Um, so now on my phone, I want to press uh, sensor data because I'm going to be using a, a Pasco sensor to collect data from. And then this is going to look for all the Pasco devices in the room that are turned on at the minute. I've just got my temperature sensor turned on, so that's all it can see. And then I'm going to pair it to this um, unique sensor, just using this unique ID code down here. So there's 196378, which matches the one on my phone, which is perfect. So I'm going to press it to connect. And you can see that it can just see uh, temperature from this one sensor. 
um, and I'm going to click graph because I want to uh, graph my data. Excellent, you can see that we're sampling at two hertz at the bottom, which is two data points per second. And then we've got this uh, live data bar at the bottom as well, which shows the ambient temperature in my room should be about 22.3 degrees. And then if I want to start collecting data, all I've got to do is just hit start. And then if I grab the end of it, you can see it rocket up because I'm very warm today. <laughs> and it means I'm alive, which is excellent. So you can see it's fairly responsive. Um, obviously, it is a stainless steel probe, so it has got some thermal inertia um, wrapped up in that. Um, if you are looking for something with a with a with a faster response, um, we do have fast response temperature probes, which is essentially just a wire. Um, so they respond really, really quickly if you want to do some like really fast kinetics. Um, this thing can see from about I think it's about minus 30 degrees up to 125 degrees C. Um, so you can do a whole heap of stuff with it, including like the freezing and boiling of water. One of our customers did put one of these inside a kettle and boil the kettle. Um, we definitely rec wouldn't recommend that you do that. It will definitely break the sensor if you do that. Um, but again, these things come with a five year warranty. So um, if anything accidental does happen to them um, or if it fails, just let us know and uh, we can replace it for you free of charge, um, which is fantastic, really, for a 50 pound price. Um, it's really amazing that, that Pasco do offer you that kind of warranty on, on an item like this. Right, OK, so that's kind of equilibrated out to my body temperature. So if we uh, waft this around, maybe I shouldn't have let it go that high. Let me put it in some water and cool it down. So I've just got a, uh, a cup of water here just to get it back down to room temperature. Maybe a bit lower. Right. <laughs> so, say for example, if you wanted to uh, measure the rate of uh, heating from my body, we'd be able to do that. So let me just run through that quickly for you. All we'd have to do is select some data. So um, that is the button next to the, the little hand. Um, so I'm going to quickly click on that. I'm going to grab a nice portion of data that looks linear. Let me just zoom in a bit. Uh, um, oh, nope. Let's go for this bit and then fit function. So it's the uh, it's the little scatter plot with a straight line through it. I'm going to press that and then it's going to do a linear fit for me. So that gives you the value for M, the gradient and the value for B, the Y axis intercept. So you can do uh, really basic kinetics um, uh, with the curve fit tools, which is cool. Um, where are we now in terms of temperature? Right, so let me show you another neat trick with one of these. We're still connected. Let me come to a new page. I want a graph display again. And I want to select measurement and tap temperature. Oh, we'll undo that run. And then what I'm going to do is I've got some nail polish remover here. So um, essentially some acetone. What I'm going to do is I'm going to plot my temperature sensor. Let's uh, start data collection. Plot my temperature sensor inside the acetone. Just let it equilibrate a little bit. So it was in the water before, and um, now it's uh, now it's creeping up to the temperature of my acetone, which has been at room temperature for a while. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the temperature sensor out and just waft it around, and then you should see some evaporative cooling taking place. Um, which is where the acetone is leaving the temperature sensor. It requires energy to do that by evaporation, and that's why we're going to see a temperature drop. So let's have a go. I stretch my data out. So we see we get this nice sharp decrease, which is evaporative cooling, which is really, really cool. It's just like a really nice quick demonstration to be able to do with, with just this one temperature sensor. I've got some fumes going on in here, guys, from <laughs> from this uh, nail polish remover. So again, you could do a nice linear fit to that if you wanted to, to get kind of like the average rate of it of it cooling. Um, I'm going to press stop now just because it's going back up. Um, so yeah, you can also do things like cooling curves, Newton's law of cooling, um, which is just, for example, where you uh, put the temperature sensor in like a hot 
cup of tea, hot cup of water, um, and then just look at the um, the kinetics of it cooling. Um, you get a perfect trace every time. I did that for, um, I think it was a cup of tea, maybe about six months ago. All of that's on my Twitter feed. Um, I literally ran the experiment once and it worked perfectly. The data was fit really perfectly. But obviously that experiment takes quite a long time to run. Um, so that's why I'm not going to do it today. So someone's just asked how much of the temp sensor needs to be in the liquid. So the sensing element in this thing is like in the last centimetre of the probe. Um, so definitely that needs to be submerged in your sample. Um, if you have more than that, then that's not a problem. But yeah, definitely at least submerge that that bottom um, centimetre. It is it is a stainless steel probe, so you will get conduction across the whole um, probe. But yeah, like I said, just uh, that bottom centimetre. Um, Right, so we will come back to this when we do neutralisation. I'm going to use this in conjunction with the uh, pH sensor, just so you can see whether the reaction is exothermic or endothermic. So I'm just going to turn this one off for now, just to save its battery. Um, this is powered by a coin cell battery, by the way. So you don't have to keep recharging it or anything. It's really low maintenance. When the time comes that you do need to charge the battery, like I say, you'll get that battery indicator light coming on. <coughs> Um, and the coin batteries cost anything from about 50p, so it's super cheap to be able to um, maintain and uh, replace the batteries in here. All you've got to do is just unscrew this little back cap and uh, put a new coin cell battery in there. OK, so <laughs> moving on quickly to the wireless pH uh, sensor. Um, this is essentially two probe, well not two probes, it comes in like two halves. So you've got the sensor module here and then you've got this BNC connector on the end. Uh, and then you've got the probe here, the electrode um, with this BNC receptor here. So what you've got to do is just screw it on. And um, like I just said, if you, uh, if you, if your electrode does break and you need to source another one, um, we do sell that um, separately. And we also sell this module, um, the sensor module separately as well, just to keep the cost down for you if you just need to um, replace one part of it. So it's got a buffer solution at the bottom, which it's stored in. I think it's, what is it? Uh, four molar potassium chloride. Um, so again, we just pair this in exactly the same way as we did our temperature sensor. So I'm just going to turn it on using that uh, button. Again, we've got that red LED light flashing saying it's uh, ready to pair. So I'm going to come back to my main screen, tap sensor data, tap on pH, which is the same code that's on the uh, on the module here. I'm only seeing your screen, no apparatus you're talking about. Ugh. Sorry, Fran. Um, let me just make sure that this is. So, yeah, it is my, my video is definitely spotlighted. I, I am aware it probably is only coming up as a tiny little thumbnail, but hopefully you can still see roughly what I'm talking about. Um, on my screen, I think if you come to more action, more actions, I think you can have a look at gallery. Um, so if you click on that, um, it might help me ping up on your feed. Hopefully everyone else can see me. I know it is a pain in the bum um, teams and everyone's got a slightly different platform, I think, depending on what update you're on and <laughs> what device you're on and whether you've got a paid for platform or, or not. We've only got the free one, so I don't know if that makes any difference or not. But yeah, I do apologise about that. Um, we are going to be sending out a link to the recording. So if you can't see me, please don't worry, you will get a, uh, a link to the recording. So hopefully you'll be able to see what's on my screen now. So you'll be able to see my shared screen and also my uh, uh, the apparatus as well that I'm talking about. So Claire's just uh, suggested a, a workaround on on the chat as well to click on NS at the bottom of the of the, of the screen to to switch to my video feed and not the data if that helps. It's always going to be problems with whatever platform we use, I think. <laughs> OK, perfect. <laughs> I'm sorry, it's a bit of a workaround for you. Um, right, OK, so this is on and ready to pair. So on my phone, I'm going to click on the pH to get it to connect. And bingo, here we are. Right. So what do I want to show you? Um, let's do how to calibrate it first. So I don't have any buffer solutions at home, which is a problem. We need two buffer solutions to be able to calibrate this properly. Um, but I will show you how to do it regardless. If I 
click on so, so let me just show you this first um the ph sensor can measure both voltage and ph so the voltage is just basically like the raw data reading that the sensor module connect, uh, collects and then ph is really the thing that we want to um the thing that we want to measure so if i just click on graph for example um and then if i come down to the which button is it? i think it might be this bluetooth nope is it this one? Bear with me one second. Nope. Bingo, it's that one. <laughs> so on the bottom of the screen, you can see that I've got like, um, oh, someone is coming in. Bear with me one second. So on the bottom of the screen, we've got those four icons. The first one's the coding one, and then we've got those cross tools for settings. And then we've got like that picture of a sensor and a cogwheel. And that is the one that I need to tap. And that's going to bring up all of my uh, um, connected sensors um, and some settings with what we can play around with them. So I'm going to click on the little crosshair that's next to pH, which is going to take me into the calibration uh, menu. So the first one says select a sensor. Obviously, we want to calibrate this uh, pH sensor. And then it says select a calibration type. So we're just going to leave it as two point um, adjust slope and offset. So it's literally just going to create like a, a linear graph for us and then um, correct our readings based on two measurements. Um, so if I just press continue on that one, what it asks for is a standard value. Um, so that's going to be the value of your first buffer solution. So it suggests maybe to use uh, pH 4. So what I would do in that um, in that case is I would take my buffer solution off, put it somewhere where I'm not going to knock it over, put it on the windowsill, um, and then I'd plot my probe in that pH 4 solution. I'd let it equilibrate um, and then press uh, set calibration. And then what I do is I'd uh, rinse my probe off um, and that asks you to put in another standard value, so another buffer solution, for example, buffer 10. Um, and then you'd put the probe after you've washed it off, put it in the buffer 10 solution um, and then press set calibration again. Um, and then you're done. That's literally the whole calibration procedure. Um, I have written that through that process step by step in the notes, which again, uh, you'll get an email as a follow up from the webinar. So you'll have exactly how to do that step by step in, in the notes. So if that's something that you, you are interested in doing with the uh, with the pH sensor, all you've got to do is just download that afterwards and then you'll be you'll be set. Um, so I'm just going to click OK here. So the calibration is invalid because I haven't actually done anything, but we can just click OK and then press cancel. Right, so let's do something a bit more exciting with this. Um, I've got a beaker here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to get some coke. How frequently is calibration required? Um, essentially, just just as often as you really want to do it. I think for most, uh, well, for the required practicals, um, it's probably a good idea to get your students used to doing that anyway. Um, I mean, if you, if you before you run a lab session, if you want to just put this in a buffer solution just to see how accurately it's reading, um, then that that would that would definitely be recommended. Um, but I mean, the calibration procedure is so quick and easy um, that if you if you did have to run it quite often, it wouldn't be a problem. Um, but I, I don't I don't think you'd have to run it every single time. I think it's just when it starts going iffy. Um, and these things are guaranteed for five years, so so it's not expected that they do um, like run wild in terms of <laughs> in terms of what what they're reading. Um, so yeah, I wouldn't worry too much about that one. So beaker, and then I've got some coke here. Caffeine free because pregnant. <laughs> it's the only coke we've got in the house. Um, so I'm going to put 100 ml in there. And then what I'm going to do is I'm also going to pair my uh, temperature probe. I'm going to plonk my pH in here. Let me just put up a reading so you can see what it can see. And then if I go on this single reading and then if I click on that digits display that 1.23 and then select measurement pH plonk that in here, press start and you can see it's nice and acidic which is what we'd expect and I'm also going to pair my temperature probe so to get this to pair I need to stop data collection and then I can come up to my bluetooth button in the top toolbar click on my temperature probe and then press done plonk this in my beaker as well so if I come back to my graph of pH against time, 
what I can do is I can add a secondary y-axis. So that is the one <laughs> next to the T. I'm very aware that you can't see my cursor on, <laughs> on my phone screen. Um, so yeah, let me just describe what the uh, icons look like for you. It's the one to the right of the T, which, is I'm gonna, which I'm gonna press to get a secondary y-axis. And then I'm gonna click select measurement on that secondary y-axis and press temperature. So now I'm plotting both pH and temperature as a function of time on the same graph. Right, so let's press start and get some data running so we get a bit of a baseline. Right, now what I've got here is an Alka-Seltzer. I don't know if you guys have ever had one of these before, but they taste absolutely disgusting. <laughs> um, let me just break it in half. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to plot both of these halves in the beaker and see what happens to both my temperature and pH at the same time. So this is why I've only put 100 mil in my beaker to make sure it doesn't overflow everywhere and make a mess on my desk. So now we've got two traces which look like they're behaving very nicely. So this is basically my take on a neutralisation experiment <laughs> using stuff that I've actually got in my house that, that we can use safely. I keep wanting to use my mouse thinking it's uh, the software on there, it's on my phone isn't it? And then if I stretch my data out just to see it a bit more clearly, we've got that lovely crossover curve. So the green is let's have a look y2 from my from my legend on the graph is that right sorry no uh yeah so the both, both the green and the pink are y2 sorry both the green and the pink are run two um the green is y1 which we can see is ph so my ph has gone from uh being what's that like maybe three point why don't i get my coordinates tool out and have a look if i stop I'm going to get my coordinates tool out, which essentially looks like that little crosshair, which is um, the icon next to the hand in the box. I'm going to press that and drag it down to. Oh, I need to click on the little green um, data point up here so it knows what data set I want to look at. Oh, I might need to click on another one. Here we go. So we've gone from a pH of about 3.35 up to what are we up here, like 5.89. So it's not fully neutralised, but it's a it's a good way there. Maybe it needs a little bit more antacid to uh, to get up to seven. Um, and then in terms of temperature, we've come down. Let me go on the pink one. We've come down from about 18 degrees to about 17 so it's only been a small change in temperature but we can see that that temperature has come down so we can see that this is a um, an endothermic reaction because it's uh, um, taking energy and taking temperature sorry is that right yeah it's not giving a, it's not giving energy out has it it's got to be endothermic it's required energy to uh, to make that change um, so that's the coordinates tool as well that's a really nice handy tool so you can kind of like just see what's happening with your data and you can have that um, as many of those as you like per per data run. And then if you want to delete it, you can do that just by clicking that little um, X just to get rid of that box. So again, that's a super nice, quick, easy way to do a, a neutralization experiment, um, not just using one sensor, using both. Um, you can connect up to about four sensors at any one time to spark you. Um, all depending on sampling frequency as well. Um, so if you've got a lot of sensors going, just make sure you're not sampling too high just to make sure that your bandwidth stays OK. Um, right, so I think that's everything I wanted to show you with these two. So we can move on. Let me just turn these ones off. There we go. Give this a wash off before I put it buffer solution. There we go. Covered in coke. And let me move that before I spill it over <laughs> Right. 
So moving on now to the light sensor. We're about halfway through, which is good. We're about halfway through the stuff. So if I come to uh, that hamburger at the top of the screen, just to take us back to the main menu, if I press uh, start new experiment, and we can start all over again. Oh, I think my uh, phone display has crashed. Let me come out of here and start it up again. Uh, where are we? So if I press sensor data, oh, it's a bit laggy. Let's try and close it down and start it up again. What is struggling? There we go. Sorry, just needed a closing and opening again. So what I've done, this uh, this is our wireless light sensor. I've just turned it on using the, the power button here. Oh my, what is happening today? <laughs> All the technical glitches are happening on this one one. Um, quick sense data again. So I've turned this one on again, the, the LED uh, status is flashing red, showing that it's ready to pair. I am gonna press on light to connect. Oh, I think I must be, oh, it doesn't matter. So if, if you use these at home, definitely do update at the time. I'm not gonna do it right now because it might take a few moments and I don't wanna waste any time with the webinar. I thought I'd updated it earlier, but obviously I, I must have picked up the wrong one. <laughs> I've got two light sensors here, you see, I must have picked up the wrong one, I hadn't updated. Right, so this is going to show us everything that we can measure just with this one sensor. So this isn't just a standard light sensor, this has got lots of different things that you can measure just in, in this one unit. So it's got two different light sensors, we've got the spot one here at the front and we've also got the ambient one at the back. So in the spot sensor we can see a white, red, green and blue light, so that's an RGB detector in there. Um, so you could essentially use that as like a really primitive spectrometer. And then in the back, the ambient light sensor, um, we've got a UV sensor in there. So you can see UVA, UVB and UV index. Um, and it can also see illuminance, solar irradiance, solar irradiance and solar par. So those are essentially just um, intensity, just in different units, depending on what, um, um, what I'm looking for, what discipline you're working in, whether you're biology, chemistry or physics. Um, so uh, we've also got a quick start experiment here, which is colour sensing, uh, which is pretty cool. So I'll show you what that can do. Um, so colour sensing is essentially it just looks at the component um, RGB of what you've got in your in your light sample. So I'm going to click on our. Oh, no. <laughs> trying to use my mouse again. Going to click on RGB um, and then press colour sensing. So this pings up a graph of, um, why have you done that? It should be uh, intensity on, on the Y and then uh, red, green and blue on the bottom. Let me just see if this is going to work or not. I don't know what's done that. If I press start, oh yes, it's pinged back to light intensity. So this is what my uh, bulb looks like in my office. So we get different uh, amounts of red, green and blue light. And then if I show it what my PC screen looks like, we should see a lot more blue. Which is why it's advised not to be on your PC or watching TV or on your phone just before you go to bed, because it's going to shine a load of blue light in your eyes. So again, if you're a biologist, um, this is how your eyes work, right, with RGB cones. Um, so this is just a nice way of kind of demonstrating um, how the human eye works. Um, for the, all the different measurements that we've got in here, let me just uh, ping those back up. Um, so for the UV uh, sensing um, elements in here, um, I've got some customers at, I think it's Lancaster University, and they're doing some research into the effectiveness of different sunscreens. Um, so what they do is they apply like a thin layer of sunscreen to a, a glass slide, and then they plonk that on top of the light sensor, shine a, view, a UV light source at it, and then you can see how much of that UV is attenuated by that, by that particular sunscreen. Um, 
what else have we got on here? We've got illuminance um, on all those intensities, um, which you can use in physics. Um, and then, like I say, the RGB has got some applications in, in biology as well, as well as using it as that like really primitive spectrometer. Um, so that is the light sensor in a nutshell. Um, it's definitely not a bog standard light sensor because you can do loads and loads and loads of different things with it. Um, and we're going to do the in inverse square law with it um, a little bit later. So I'm just going to turn this off for now. There we go. And then lastly, what I've got to show you is the Pasco Smart Cart. Um, so this is um, like the most perfect dynamics trolley that you could possibly want in your physics lab. Um, so this has got, it's obviously a, a dynamics cart, it's got wheels on the bottom of it, but on top of that, it's got all of the sensors inbuilt into this, um, in, into its carcass. Um, bigger than I thought it would be. <laughs> Um, yeah, I guess it's quite big. Um, it does fit on our standard dynamics tracks, which come in both, um, well, the metal ones come in 1.2 metres or 2.2 metres. Um, pretty much most people go for the 1.2 metre system, I think mostly because of space. It is quite a big unit. Um, we do also offer plastic tracks as well, which um, come in like two part sections, um, both which are half a metre. Um, so... I'd only recommend really going for the plastic tracks if you are short on storage space. Um, if you need them to be like compact in that 0.5 meter space, then um, that, that's really why I'd go for that option. I wouldn't really recommend them for anything, um, any other reason, um, just because you do see an ever so slight jump just on, on that bit where they are connected. Oh, someone said we have them, they're fab. Yes, they are, Fran. Yes, they are. <laughs> Um, so just to run through what sensors are in here, I will connect this to my phone and then you can have a look. If I come back to start new experiment and start all over again and then press sensor data. It should have a look for my smart cart. Here we go. I'm going to tap on it to connect. So typically, if you are buying um, just a Pasco, call it a dumb cart, which is literally just a cart that doesn't have any sensors in. Um, if you wanted to do any sort of data logging with it, you'd have to buy all the sensors as well. So it can get quite pricey. Um, these things, I think they're about £200 and um, definitely no more than that. That's definitely the, the highest price that they'll be. Um, but in terms of what you actually get in terms of um, sensors in here, it is, it is worth the price. Um, so these are all the different uh, measurements that it can that it can take. So it's got a position sensor which is encoded in the wheels. Um, so this has got an optical encoder in there which can read position, velocity and, and, and acceleration just by differentiating um, that position measurement once for velocity and twice for acceleration. It's also got a force sensor hiding just behind this magnetic bumper here so you can just unscrew this and take it off. It comes with a little hook so you can uh, like um, measure forces off it um, either vertically or or in this plane. Um, and it also comes with a little rubber bumper as well so you can look at forces um, in this direction as well as that direction. Um, we can also see acceleration. So it's got a little accelerometer built into the cart just where this um, little diagram is if you need to know the exact location of it. It's hiding right underneath where that where that little schematic is. So it can see acceleration in the X, Y and Z planes um, and it can also give you the resultant acceleration. And then we've got angular velocity as well, which is the little gyroscope in there. So this looks at um, angular rotation of the car. Um, so if you wanted to put this on a on a spinning arm, for example, you'd be able to do things like that. If you put it on a um, like a wheelie office chair as well, that, yeah, you can you can get some data just from doing that as well, which is pretty cool. I haven't got a wheelie office chair, guys. I'm using a bog standard <laughs> dining chair table, so I won't be able to demonstrate that one for you today. Um, but yes, it comes with like a little, I um, don't know what you'd call this, like a like a, a carriage, I guess, on top. Um, and this fits our masses on um, perfectly. Um, so, for example, that F equals MA experiment, if you need to change the mass of the car, um, you could just put our mass blocks on there. And that's what that's, that, that's what that bit's for. Um, but Pasco, I've got a huge amount of accessories for this thing, which makes it super cool. You can do even more stuff with it. So let me just click on uh, position, velocity and acceleration. And then if I press graph, you can also see on the right hand side here that we've got these quick start experiments. 
Um, so these are experiments that Pasco have written that are already embedded in the software. And if you wanted to prompt one of those, all you've got to do is just click on one of them and it'll ping up with all the graphs that you'd need to do that experiment. I think I am going to run a webinar just on smart carts and dynamics tracks. Um, so we will definitely come back to that. So if I click on graph, we're going to get this uh, lovely plot of position, velocity and acceleration all on three different graphs. Um, and then if I press start, and then I just move this back and forwards, you can kind of get an idea of what's going on here. And then if I stretch the data out, you can kind of see uh, like the, the phase nature of, of these three things. Could you put the quick start experiments into shared labs so the students can see the data? Yeah, definitely. Um, let's have a look at one of those in a minute. I don't quite know how big those files are. Um, if they are big files and they contain a lot of pictures, um, then that might be a problem in terms of like lagging. Um, so I would definitely recommend testing it on your school um, Wi-Fi system first <laughs> before you do it with you in front of your in in front of your whole class because if it, if it is a large file to get across in the server, it might um. Um, it might struggle a little bit, um, but if everyone had a de if everyone had a device anyway, they'd all be able to open that um, um, open that file on their individual devices anyway. So you might not have to do that that shared session. Perfect. So if I grab the multi coordinates tool, uh, which is this one, I think if I press it, it should highlight it. Here we go, and then you can kind of scan this through and kind of look at the phase difference between the three the three different traces, which is very cool. You can see how out of phase they all are. So this is something that you didn't used to be able to do in Sparkview um, because obviously the screen is quite small to be able to do it. Um, but Pascal, we've written this in um, for you in, in one of the latest updates that, that they've done to the software. I think this was maybe written in about a year ago. So again, that's one of the really nice things about this software is that it's not um, dormant. Um, Pascal have a huge team of uh, software engineers um, that actively work on this software day by day. So if you've got any comments about it, um, if you want to uh, do something else that the software currently can't do, just let us know and we can let the team know. Um, and they're not adverse to, to writing it into, into later updates if they get enough requests for it. Can you replace the time axis with say acceleration or velocity? Yes, you can. It's completely up to you what you plot. Um, so for example, if I just press this new page icon at the top and then go for a graph. Uh, sorry, sorry, single display and then click on the graph display. Um, select measurement. So say for example, if we wanted to do position against and then I can't see my <laughs> my X axis on the screen, so I'm going to have to collapse these graph tools by pressing that um, graph icon on the far left. And then I can click on time and then change it to velocity, for example. And then you get this odd looking graph, which is essentially a phase graph. <laughs> um, so this might be a bit of an odd example, um, but you definitely can do that. Yeah. Right, so in the last 10 minutes, let's quickly get set up for the inverse square law. So what I'm going to do is, oh, that's a nasty sound. Um, there's a website called Thingiverse where you can print off some 3D printed items. And there's quite a few Pasco bits on there. Um, and this is something called a light sensor bracket. Oh, this is what I used to do with the data studio. Oh, you are. <laughs> You're, you're um, one of the legacy Pasco users, that's cool. Um, so Data Studio, for anyone that doesn't know, is one of Pasco's older software suites that isn't supported anymore. I think a couple of customers are still using it, um, but um, Capstone's really the, um, what would you call it? The like replacement product for Data Studio. Um, so yeah, this is our light sensor bracket. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna clip it onto our smart car. And then it's got a little hole in the top. So I've just used a thumb screw. I can't remember where I've got it from. It's some kind of Pasco kit. Um, but this conveniently goes in this little hole in the light sensor. So this is a threaded hole. Um, it will be an imperial measurement because it's a Pasco product. It's designed in the, in the US. Pasco used to make everything in the US, but um, I think they've outsourced some of the stuff now. They still make some stuff, um, but some of it's made in China just because it's cheaper. 
cheaper to manufacture. So smart cart sensor, <laughs> sorry, smart cart sensor bracket and the light sensor on top of it. So what I need to do now is connect both of these things. So obviously you can do the inverse square law just with the light sensor and just using a meter stick or a ruler or a tape measure. Um, but we're going to do it with the smart cart so that we can plot our position or distance really quite conveniently. So both of these things are on. Let me come back to a new experiment. I want to pair both of these, so I'm going to click on smart car and also light. Oh, there's me update warning again. So I definitely want position and I definitely want right. So you will see I can't use a um, I can't use the ambient sensor because that's on the underneath. I'm going to have to use the spot sensor. So in the spot sensor, we've either got white, red, green or blue. So I'm going to want the white light. So I'm going to click on graph. And I don't want this kind of graph. I want a different one. So I'm going to click on that new page icon at the top. Come to single display, come to graph. Click select measurement on the Y axis. So I want white. Click, And then collapse my graph tool so I can see my X axis. And then I want position down here. Press position. Perfect. Get rid of my Coke. Right now, I'm going to. Is there a pattern for the bracket? Yes, there is. Um, I've put a link to that in the notes. Um, I can also find it afterwards if you like and plunk it in the chat if that would be useful. Um, but yeah, there is a link. I think if you just type into Google um, Pasco um, light sensor bracket thingiverse, it will come up. Um, I'm going to turn the light off and turn this lamp on just so we get rid of the, well, get rid of most of the, the ambient light in the room. Right, let's have a go with this. So I'm going to put my cart and the light sensor really close to the bulb and try and get it square on. That looks good enough to me. Right, so if I press start and then I'm just going to move the cart away from the sensor, sorry, move the cart away from the light source as far as it will come on my desk and see what that gets us if I press start. Here we go. Oh, we've, I've moved quite far away from the light bulb. Let me uh, take it straight back. If I just delete that last run, okie doke, and press start. Here we go. Oh, guys, I forgot to change my sampling frequency. Hang on. So I need to come down into the bottom left just so I get a bit more data um, where it says periodic two hertz. I'm going to click on that little cogwheel down there. And I'm going to change it to if I click on common sample rate, I'm going to click on position sensor, change that to five hertz. It'll give me slightly better data and then come back to sensor and click on that spotlight sensor. Change that to five hertz as well. Uh, let me delete that last data run again and then hit start right oh so you can see we're collecting a lot more data points now it should hopefully make my uh, data set a bit more accurate drag it back as far as it'll go So you see we're leveling off now as we expect. And if I hit stop. And then blow my data up so I can see it a bit more clearly. Ooh. So it's looking like it's kind of the right relationship. <laughs> Let's try fitting it and see what happens. So I'm going to click this uh, data selection tool again. Uh, you'll see that my light sensor was saturated at the beginning, which is why we've got that like level out point at the, at the beginning of the data set. We don't want to fit that because it won't work. So if I go for oh, let's go for this bit. And then if I click that uh, curly function next to the linear one, 
and then I can click Info Square Fit and see what that looks like. Oh, so it's not perfect, <laughs> but it's kind of getting into where it needs to be. Does anyone know why it's not perfect? Can anyone have a guess? Right, OK, so it's because I've not got a perfect point source. So the inverse square law only works for a perfect point source, um, which my light bulb, unfortunately, is not. Um, so what we can do is we can do some maths um, and we can work out what my N is. So obviously with the inverse square law, let me just come to here. I've done the maths for us here. Inverse square law can be simplified as uh, intensity is proportional to um, one over the R to the N, which we know N is two for the inverse square law. But if we write it like this form, we can actually rearrange to find n. So if we take some logs, we eventually get down to this equation down here. And then if we compare this to y equals mx plus c, we know that a plot of log of intensity against log of the distance will give us a gradient of minus n. So we can see what n, we can see what value of n we're getting if it's not exactly two. Um, so to do that, we need to go to calculated data. Um, how do I do that? Is it this one? So it's that little, the, those little cross tools at the bottom. And then if I go to calculated data, um, if I want like log of white, oops, log white, and then equals, uh, Where's the button? Is it this one, two, three? Yeah, I need log of and my measurements. Oh, it's my measurements gone. Log of white and then done. Oh, it's difficult to do this on my phone, guys. <laughs> Let me, um, I think it's that bracket. And then come to white. And then close the bracket. Done. And then I also need, if I come to my keyboard, log of position uh, and then an equal sign oh. it's gonna be this one. Oh my god I've got chubby finger syndrome <laughs> oh no uh, log <laughs> Um, and then I need my measurement in there, which is position. Hey, we finally got there. Right, done, and a return. Go away, ABC, done. So that's everything that I need. So now I've got my log of the intensity, which is log of Y and log of the position, which is log R, and then press OK. So then I can come to my Y axis, Oh, guys, I've just realised I haven't been doing that on my shared screen. <laughs> um, all of that's written down in the notes, so you'll be able to see that um, and follow it step by step. So I'm going to come to here now. Let me just quickly show you, actually, it's in this, this button here, calculated data. This is what I was doing, fanning about doing this. Right, done. OK, so I need to come to this one. I need to go to user entered and then it's going to get my calculation from here. Uh, we want log of y on the y-axis and then log of position. Da -da. And then if I oh, get rid of this and come and have a look at it. So we want the linear portion of our data and I'm going to fit to it. I need to press this position tool. Have a look at the linear bit. Let's go for that bit. Oh, I can see your calculation steps. Oh, let's hope so. That would be great. <laughs> um, 
uh, and then I need to linearly fit that. So let's press this button. So my M is 1.4. So you can see it's not exactly two, which is why it is off when we try and do that inverse square fit. But that's all because I thought I had a good bulb at home, but unfortunately it turns out I don't. <laughs> but that, that's like a nice way of verifying it. Say, for example, if um, uh, you didn't have the right bulbs at school, I know that's very improbable. Um, but if you wanted to take it one step further rather than just getting them to do um, that curly fit, that curved fit, um, you could get them to linearize it and do it, do it like this instead. Oh, and my software has just crashed. And that is probably the software telling me that it, the time is up <laughs> and I need to start rabbiting on. Um, so we